All right, good evening. Welcome to the June 15 version of the Community Development Committee meeting. Uh, we'd like to start out by taking a roll call. Dan Hansen. I'm here. Ryan Shirley. Present. Jerry Van Someren. Present. Scott Counter. Present. Uh, let's hope Sean Anderson comes, and if he doesn't, we'll wonder why. Uh, we'll move into minutes approval. Does anybody have any questions or concerns about last month's meeting minutes? Very good. They'll stand approved. Um, that was for meeting minutes for uh, Thursday, April 27, Thursday, May 18, and Tuesday, May 23rd. Good. Everybody's in agreement. Public comment. Uh, we have Ms. Pabst. Or Mr. Pabst, excuse me. Lynn Pabst, forgive me. Uh, right up to the podium up here. Just tell us where you live. Okay, my name is Lynn Pabst. I live in the village of Hammond. And I'm a member of the St. Croix County Snowmobile Association. And I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about the Wildwood Trail. Wildwood Trail is something that the Snowmobile Association's used for many years, and uh, we value that we value that uh, greatly. Um, we uh, do have a couple concerns about what you guys are going to talk about tonight. Um, I want to let you know that the Snowmobile Association uh, funds that trail in the winter time, uh, and also maintains it. And what I mean by funding it is that we pay for grooming of the snowmobile trail down that, down that corridor. Also, as far as maintenance, we do all the maintenance in the winter as far as if a tree falls, something like that. Um, we also do signing um, that needs to be done on that trail. Uh, I wish in the past, when this all came to a head, that we all could have been involved, worked together. I know it's been a thorn in your side for quite a while now. Um, I think it could have been handled a little bit better. Um, compromise is a good thing, and I think we could have solved it if maybe the association would have been involved, maybe the landowners and also somebody from your committee. Maybe we could have had our own committee. But the two things I kind of want to talk about tonight is pertains to the Snowmobile Association. I've read your easement. Um, it's very good, I think. Uh, I don't have a problem with a lot of it, but there are a couple issues. One is on part of the easement, it says something about uh, landowners being able to cross. I worry about that in the winter time. Um, if they cross with a pickup or a ATV and they plow a path across so they can get across, I worry about liability if a snowmobile were to hit that ridge. Um, that's one of the biggest things that I worry about. The other thing that I worry about is in your easement, it says something about adjoining landowners. Um, if they own land, they can run their truck or their ATV to their adjoining land. And I worry about that because if they own land in mile one and they own land in mile seven, that means they could run that whole seven mile parcel. Um, that's something that I don't think would work very good for our snowmobile trail because we do try and keep the trail smooth and nice for our snowmobilers and that would tear it up. So I want you to consider this when you do your easement. Please keep us in mind and if you have any questions you can feel free to get a hold of me or anybody in the Snowmobile Association. Um, I thank you for your time and that's all I have. Thank you. Good afternoon. I've got three uh, short updates uh, today relative to St. Croix EDC and the kind of the comings and goings of that organization. Uh, first of all, uh, we participated in a legislative advocacy event in uh, Madison on April 5th of this year. Uh, our list was brief. It was a one-pager, eight items. Uh, we're not taking credit for successes, but I think some of the issues that uh, we put on our list 
are very similar to those that the county uh, would have on a list. Reform, shared revenue, uh, pay compensation for assistant district attorneys, transportation funding. We believe that there was some news that came out of Madison the last 24, 48 hours relative to an announcement on transportation funding for the two-year cycle. Uh, we believe that part of the deal that came out of uh, the transfer, or the uh, the uh, shared revenue uh, compromise also involves the elimination of personal property tax for business and industry. We've been working on that one for multiple years. News came out of UW River Falls that there's legislation that involves college tuition reciprocity. And the, the legislation would allow schools like UW River Falls, Stout, Eau Claire, the ones that are closer to the valley, but it involves Superior as well, to keep the difference that a Minnesota student would pay, and that would stay within the UW River Falls system rather than being sent to Madison. I read an account that maybe that, that would amount to $4 million attributable to UW River Falls the last, say, funding cycle. And I believe I'm going to live long enough to, uh, to see this one through. Uh, we would still like to see Minnesota and Wisconsin uh, come to some agreement regarding the income tax reciprocity agreement that was unilaterally terminated by then Governor Tim Pawlenty. Uh, it really is of benefit to the commuting base uh, here in St. Croix County and in the Valley to have to just file simply one one uh, income tax return rather than two, one for Minnesota, one for Wisconsin. I was also part of a uh, tourism event that was held on May 11th that was in conjunction with Tourism Week in Wisconsin. Uh, a couple of my colleagues behind me, um, Brett and John, were part of the planning team. St. Croix EDC was able to financially uh, underwrite or support uh, that uh, conference. It was a two and a half hour conference. 35 folks uh, pre registered, another eight or 10 walked in the day of. Uh, the headliner was uh, Mary Monroe Brown, director of the Office of Outdoor Recreation. A lot of statistical information came out of that. And I think it, the event was to serve as a springboard for subsequent two hour events like that. A lot of, it was a great crowd that attended and a lot of ideas that came out of that. Tourism part two. Last week, uh, the Wisconsin Department of Tourism, as they do annually, uh, released their spending, traveler spending estimates. Good news coming out of St. Croix, travelers spent nearly $128 million last year. Uh, they go to events, they go to a soccer event, they go to, they dine, they cross a state line to do that. Um, good news is, that that number today now or for 2022 exceeds 2019's number. And we all know what happened in 2020. So the pre-pandemic pre number of 2019 has now finally been surpassed. It's been surpassed in Polk, Pierce and St. Croix. It's been surpassed by the st in the state of Wisconsin. And, and uh, again, there's a, a variety of issues or topics that come out of the report that uh, tourism does, employment, uh, state and local taxes that are generated as a result of, uh, of tourism. We uh, put together a short news summary on that. It's been posted, it's been read multiple times. Last item, St. Croix EDC conducted its annual meeting on May 9th. There was an orderly transition in leadership. Uh, Krista Paulus, uh, a resident of the New Richmond area, commercial banker uh, by trade, uh, is the president until uh, May of 2024. There were three departing directors. I think some of you may know and remember Agnes Ring, former county supervisor, served her maximum uh, two, three-year terms and departed, as did Angela Popenhagen, an engineer from the uh, town of Hudson, and Matt Sparks, who serves as the general manager of Baldwin Lightstream. They were replaced by uh, Brian Hines, who is an architect by trade, and Searles, who operates uh, and runs uh, as the executive director of the St. Croix Valley Food Bank, and uh, Carrie Borgstrom, another New Richmond area resident, who again by trade is a, a commercial lender. Um, so the officers for the next tw uh, 12 months would be Krista Paulus, Susan Lockwood, um, executive from uh, 
uh, Northwood Technical College in New Richmond, the New Richmond campus. Tom Lunen is an attorney uh, from Loma Nelson, uh, Loma Nelson, Eckberg Lammers, uh, offices in Stillwater and Hudson, and Marina Onken, a retired uh, dean at the College of Business and Economics from UW-River Falls, continues to serve as secretary treasurer. So those are my updates. Uh, keep up the good work. Good things are happening around the county as you as you uh, drive around, I just I happen to mention to, to Mr. Paps that there's a very nice project underway in Hammond. Uh, it probably goes in excess of 200,000 square feet that will be used as a distribution facility, hoping to capture the traffic from I-94. And so there are projects like that. Now, that maybe is the extreme, but there are projects like that occurring all over the county. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. All right, so we'll move into uh, public hearings, but I'd like to make sure that we understand that today, uh, as we did last month, we'll do public hearing number one, and then we'll move into business item number one so that we have that information fresh and we can take care of that. And then we'll leapfrog uh, the three public hearings to the three business items, the first three business items on the agenda, starting with ordinance to rezone uh, the uh, 2.735 acres in Kinney Kinnick. So John will give us that uh, staff report for that public hearing is open. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. The first uh, item on your agenda tonight is a public hearing related to a rezoning application request in the town of Kinnick Kinnick. Specifically, we are at 263 Liberty Road. The applicant is Scott Aikshin representing Green Pastures Family Farm. The request tonight is to go from the Ag2 Agricultural Zoning District to the R2 Residential Zoning District, and the subject parcel tonight is 2.735 acres in size. The applicant is requesting the rezoning in order to establish a parcel for an existing dwelling on the 2.7 acre lot to be rezoned. The remaining 7.37 acres of the 10 acres will stay in the Ag2 zoning district. The intention of the owner is to remodel an existing outbuilding into a guest house as part of the farm stay experience associated with Ag entertainment activities. County staff has viewed this guest house as a dwelling unit that needs its own parcel. So what's going on with this is that we not only have a rezoning application being processed, but we also have a certified survey map being processed concurrently and we'll show you a, um, a draft CSM here in just a moment. The minimum lot size requirements for a parcel zone R2 in the town of Kinnick is two acres and the minimum lot size requirement for a parcel zone AG2 is three acres. The proposed lot sizes would exceed these requirements. Next we're just going to walk through some location maps to give the committee some idea of where the parcel is. City of River Falls at the bottom left, Highway 35, Highway 65 running up to Roberts, and then Liberty Road extending south off of Highway 65. The subject 10-acre parcel is in red. Next, we'll take a little bit closer look at the 10-acre piece. You see the Kinnick Kinnick River meandering through the south portion of the site. You see the existing home location at this site the barn and related accessory buildings, and then the accessory building at this location that's proposed to be converted into a guest house. So this is the proposed certified survey map um, outlining the 10 acres. We highlighted the red line going east to west across uh, the existing lot. This would be the proposed lot division. Lot four on top would be the 2.735 acre parcel that would facilitate the existing homestead. And that's what's being proposed to be rezoned to R2. The remaining 7.37 acres, which is south of this red line, would be a separate lot, shown as lot five, and would retain its AG2 zoning, which is the current zoning. And this um, building right here, the arrow pointing to this um, existing outbuilding would be the building converted to the guest house. It would not be enlarged, it would retain its existing dimension. 
This is just a wider scale aerial photo to show what's going on in the area of Kinnikinnik. You see largely agricultural to the north, northeast, to the southeast. You have the Kinnick River meandering through here, um, and then Highway 65 running across. And then we just took some Google Street View snaps and enlarged them for um, the benefit of tonight's hearing. This photo is taken from Liberty Road looking northeast into the parcel um, from uh, Liberty Road. You see the larger uh, barn in the background, and then you see the smaller structure that my cursor is at. This is the existing outbuilding that would be converted um, to the guest house. And then we'll just take another look at the property from the north side of the parcel from Liberty Road looking north. You see the existing homestead um, kind of behind the trees here, and again, looking at the barn uh, from the north. Next, we're just going to provide a little bit of background um, on the existing zoning in the area. So the subject parcel being rezoned or proposed to be rezoned is in the dark blue. So you'll see that it's currently zoned agricultural 2. It would be proposed to be rezoned R2. We have a number of parcels that are existing R2 around it. And then we also have a piece to the west that zone conservation, and that is a parcel owned by the Department of Natural Resources. The general area is again categorized either as farmed or wetland natural areas associated with the Kinnikinnick River. Next, as we discussed in other rezonings, um, comprehensive plans play an important part in the review of a rezoning request. Um, official zoning maps, such as rezonings tonight, are required to be consistent with the local government unit's comprehensive plan per Wisconsin statute. So here we just took a snippet of the future land use plan map from the town of Kinnikinnick. We highlighted the subject parcel in yellow at the tip of the red arrow. And you can see the parcel is in the white area, which is generally categorized as agricultural residential in the town comprehensive plan. And within the town plan, they go on to state that in this area, the ag residential designation are for areas for agricultural uses, commercial uses serving agriculture, and limited residential uses. Other applicable policies, land use decisions will protect economic interests and property rights, maintain diversity in ag related uses, and encourage the preservation of farming options, including far hobby farms and the ability to farm by existing and future operations. Next, we take a look at the St. Croix County Comprehensive Plan, and we provided a map below that shows the parcel outlined in red. And you can see in this map here that the parcel is guided for mixed rural um, agriculture. And under the county um, definition of that category, the mixed rural ag is to preserve productive ag lands while allowing some residential development. Um, it goes on to describe things a little bit further. Lands in this land use category may be zoned AG1 or AG2 and R1 or R2. There is some flexibility in this zoning uh, or in this land use category. The other thing we want to point out is that the, um, oops, is that the subject parcel is included within a farmland preservation plan. Again, the tip of the red arrow, subject parcel highlighted in red. And again, this is part of the farmland preservation plan, and which is why the parcel was originally zoned AG2. The parcel was rezoned in 2018 from rural residential to AG2. Parcels on the farmland preservation plan map are eligible for AG1 or AG2 zoning, or can remain zoned R1 or R2. Parcels that are removed from AG1 or AG2, such as the situation is tonight, must meet that cap criteria that we will cover in just a moment. And again, the farmland preservation map below. Next, we're going to take a look at some natural resource features relating to the site. Um, the southern portion of the subject parcel is included within an environmental corridor. An environmental corridor is a singular or series of environmental resources, including lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, wetlands, wooded areas, floodplain, floodplains and shoreland areas. 
Um, in this particular case, the environmental cor corridor does correspond to the Kinnikinnick River. The parcel is included within a shoreland area, which is within 300 feet of a navigable river or stream, and you can see that by the green crosshatch. Shoreland areas are regulated through St. Croix County Code Chapter 16, shoreland zoning, and it does establish setbacks and purvis areas, land disturbance, buffer vegetation, and lot size requirements. So any proposals for modification or earthwork would have to comply with Chapter 16, and we are the administrative arm for the DNR for this program or this ordinance. Next, we take a look at areas of productive farmland in the area, and you can see it's, it's largely agricultural. As noted previously, the subject property includes a single family dwelling with associated driveways and yard areas associated with the dwelling unit. So currently, there is no farming taking place on the 2.735 acres. Should the rezoning be approved uh, by the county board, the applicant will need to obtain the following approvals. And this is just to give the committee an idea of what the next steps would be for the applicant. They would need to secure a driveway permit from the town for an access onto Liberty Road for the second lot. A sanitary permit for the guest house through St. Croix County would be required. And then a land use permit would be required for any work, if any, within the Shoreland Overlay District, as we mentioned earlier. And that would be for any earthwork, um, any grading that would have to be done around the proposed conversion of the accessory building to the guest house. Um, with all of our rezoning applications, we do ask the town to um, provide recommendations. At this point in time, the town of Kinnikinnick Town Board has not provided a recommendation. The town has traditionally reviewed and approved a certified survey map before they consider a rezoning recommendation that is associated with a lot split, such as this situation. So currently, the schedule for town review is for plan commission review on June 21st and the town board on July 11th. We also sent the application to the DNR for their review and comment. And similarly to other applications within the Shoreland Overlay District, their comments are basically making sure that the applicant complies with the Shoreland Overlay District requirements and the floodplain um, requirements. Um, and again, the county is the administrative arm for those programs. Technical review findings, looking at the county comp plan, looking at some applicable objectives, is to guide growth into developed areas consistent with the community's willingness and ability to accommodate growth, guide rural development to locations that will not convert existing productive ag land, provide a balance of land use types throughout the county, and again, just looking at some of the natural resource features and making sure the request is not in conflict with the St. Croix County Natural Management Plan and ensuring that the development of the property will comply with Chapter 15 zoning. Some of the criteria the committee will need to consider is to only recommend approval subject to the following provisions, one through five, that the rezoning and use is consistent with the county and town comprehensive plan, the natural resource management plan of the county, the county zoning ordinance, and that the town has not disapproved the rezoning request. And that this rezoning and proposed use is consistent with the comp plan is, does not result in spot zoning. So before the committee tonight, you have a number of options. You can recommend approval of the zoning amendment. You can recommend disapproval or table the requests for additional information should the committee so desire. So based on staff review, it would be our recommendation findings that based on technical review findings one through five, the rezoning is consistent with the county comp plan, the town comp plan, and the county natural resource management plan, that the future land use plan maps and the future land use category descriptions in both the town and county plans support the rezoning request, that the town of Kinnick Town Board has not recommended disapproval of the rezoning request. And again, I point out the committee may want to consider tabling the matter until a recommendation 
is formally received from the town in July, as we previously discussed, and that the proposed use is consistent with and can comply with Chapter 15 of the Zoning Ordinance. And then when lands are zoned out of AG 1 or AG 2, DATCAP does have criteria that the county needs to answer in a question format. Is the land better suited for a use not allowed in the Farmland Preservation Zoning District? Our response is that the parcel seeking to be created is already occupied by a single family dwelling unit with driveways and yard areas that are not currently farmed or used for grazing. The rezoning is consistent with any applicable comprehensive plan as we discussed earlier. Um, we do believe that the request is consistent with the town and county future land use plan maps and applicable land use category descriptions. The rezoning is substantially consistent with the county certified farmland preservation plan. Again, the 2.735 acres proposed to be rezoned from Ag 2 to R2 is not converting land being used for Ag purposes, such as livestock or crop production. The rezoning will not substantially impair or limit current Ag use of surrounding parcels of land that are zoned or legally restricted to Ag uses. The adjacent properties being utilized for Ag use will not be impacted. And then <clears throat> under number six, we have some general county um, criteria when lands are rezoned out of AG 1, AG 2. The statement, there are adequate public facilities to serve the proposed and potential land use changes that would be enabled by the rezoning. And the response is that the properties will have street access to Liberty Road. An existing town road and electric services are provided to the properties and that the burdens on the county and town for providing the needed services to the proposed and potential land use changes that would be enabled by the rezoning are reasonable. Again, public services exist to the existing and proposed parcels and that the development will not cause unreasonable air, water pollution, soil erosion or adverse ad effects on natural areas. And we believe the properties will conform um, to St. Croix County Zoning Standards Chapter 15, Sanitary Standards Chapter 12, um, which is the private on-site sanitary wastewater treatment system permitting for the guest house. Based on these findings, staff would recommend approval of the request. Again, going back to number three, uh, the committee may want to discuss um, the status of the town board recommendation. That summarizes this uh, rezoning application. Thank you. Thank you, John. Let's wait with our questions until we work through the public hearing portion. Is there anybody here who would like to speak in favor of this uh, this rezoning? All right, please step up to the microphone. State your name and your address, please. Hello, my name is Alexa Action, and I live at 263. Liberty Road, River Falls, Wisconsin. Um, so I am representing Green Pastures Family Farm, and we are pursuing um, the rezoning for the homestead parcel and then to pursue the guest house. Um, if you have any questions, I can answer them. That's how public hearing works. Uh, no, you just state your case why oh, you okay. think we should um, rezone it. Yeah, so that's I, we come from a hospitality background and we're looking forward to pursuing this new business venture for a farm stay retreat. Um, our overall goal is to partner with local nonprofits. My husband and I both serve on various nonprofit boards throughout the community, um, the Kinney Corridor Collaboration, um, our Cola Mills Historic Foundation, and other nonprofits. So we would like to be able to provide a space where nonprofits can. Um, come and use the barn for small meetings, small gatherings, and then have the guest house for options for speakers to stay, um, maybe university adjunct professors that are in town um, for a short-term overnight accommodation. Um, so uses such as that. I, I would allow a question or two if anybody had a question. on Just simple question on use. No, okay. They can be complicated questions, too. Well, we, we're not supposed to pass this based on use, so we're oh, all pretty okay. careful not to touch on that in case okay. there arises a legal problem later. We don't want to get bogged down in that. Okay. So, 
Okay. That's that's the reason everybody's kind of tentative about that, Alexis. So, okay. thank you very much. Of course. Thank you for your time. Appreciate you coming. Is there anybody here who would like to speak against this rezoning? I'll ask again. Is there anybody here who would like to speak against this rezoning? That being said, I will close this public hearing and we'll move into business item number one, amending the comprehensive zoning ordinance section 21. Township 28N, range 18W, Township of Kinney Connect, rezoning 2.735 acres from Ag 2 to Agricultural Zoning to R2 Residential District. And I will entertain a motion. I'll do a motion to approve. Do we have a second? For the purpose of conversation, I will second. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, let's have uh, let's have some conversation on this. Who'd like to go first? Uh, John, um, maybe you could answer this question. I, I know this piece of this parcel of ground quite well. Um, what surprises me that that uh, it is up for this because several years ago, when in, in a former life of mine, I helped. A person uh, designed a, a heating system and a cooling system for the very same structure that uh, we're talking about tonight. And we indeed installed that. And after we installed that, I thought it was a DNR. I, I may be, I, I'm probably in error, but someone shut it down and we took everything back out again because it was A, too close to the river, um, too many driveways coming off of Liberty Road. Uh, I, I don't know all of what it was. At that time, it was going to be a a mother-in-law cabin for about a month a year. So I'm wondering, did you look back? I would, this could go back 25 years or so, and, and I think the person who owned it was Leif Erickson at that time. And he, he got quite bitter about it. And, and I've just, you know, rather than, than going one way here and having the same thing happen to these people, because that's what happened then. They had to shut it down. It was, as far as I know, it's been storage ever since then. Just stuff stashed in there. Yeah. So that, that's, that's why I, I want to ask uh, John, where you been? So I think what may have happened, as I mentioned earlier, um, prior to 2018, the parcel was zoned rural residential. And um, in 2018, the parcel was rezoned to Ag 2 for Ag entertainment activities. The only thing I could think of that might have brought up that discussion was that, um, you know, our view of the code is that you need to have two lots. It was a singular lot back then. I'm not sure the history of, of what happened, but um, the way we view the code and the reason why the application's before you tonight is that even if it's a guest house, we consider that a dwelling. It needs its separate sanitary sewer system. It needs a separate lot of record. So again, we're going from a 10 acre piece to two parcels one that's 2.735 acres, one that's 7.37 acres. With all the requests in the Shoreland Over District, we're always careful to make sure we send these applications to the DNR. We sent the full application packet. I didn't read verbatim, but you know the, um, the comments from the DNR were included in your packet. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the sanitary permit would be required um, for the guest house. That's permitted through the county. A land use permit would be needed for any areas within 300 feet of the Kinnick River. So if they do any grading or modification of the grades around the proposed guest house, yes, they will need a land use permit through the county. So I'm not sure what the specific concern or issue was um, that you had mentioned, board member, but um, I just know the history back to about 2017 when they came in for the rezoning application. I'm wondering, could that have been a township thing? Oh, I, again, I, I don't know. I just know that he got bitter and sold it and moved away. Um, but uh, so, and, and if that were the case, may, maybe there would be wisdom in in tabling this until after the Kinnikinnick town board meets. I guess it very well could have been a building permit issue, which the county does not administer. 
building permit issues, building permit violations, structural violations are handled by each town yeah. through their contract building inspector. So that may have been mm -hmm. the case. Um, I guess I'm not 100% yeah. certain. I, I know they had a separate driveway for it, and then that's been taken out. Which, so uh, you know, it was kind of separated off. But so anyway, yeah. thank you. All right, any other comments or thoughts? Scott? Just on that existing uh, <clears throat> outbuilding, uh, is that so that, that you've already checked that and verified the setbacks and everything from the high water mark of the Kinney? Yes, and the setbacks are also double checked from the new lot lines. Um, and again, it, they'd be utilizing the existing dimensions of the structure. And again, those have been checked for setback verification. And also the setbacks uh, from the, with this new line that's uh, the red line that's in there, it meets all the setbacks for any existing building to the setback of where the new line is. Yes. So the one barn looks really super close to the setback. Oops. Hang on. I went the wrong way. I believe it's a five or ten foot setback, and we did have zoning staff review that. The scale is somewhat small here, so difficult to see, but it, it did meet the minimum. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I guess I'm not against this necessarily, but I'm thinking that uh, I would prefer if we were going to, to approve this this evening, that it would be conditionally on the uh, review of and the authorization of the um, the town board. Then are you moving to table? Because that's the only way we could really assure that. We, we can't do it conditionally on saying yes if they do it. No, because we can't approve it and then rescind. We would have to, we would have to table it and then bring it back up and, and look at it depending on their depending on their status. So you would have to make a motion to table, which would be an amendment to our to our motion that's on the table. You'd you'd make a motion to table which would take precedent over the motion that's on the table. Since there isn't a county board meeting in July, it wouldn't be acted on until August. So if you tabled it to your July meeting, it would have no actual impact it would allow you to um, wait for the town recommendation and then make your decision in July and have it be acted on in August so it has no actual impact on the property owners John have you talked to the people in Kinney Connect did they give you any informal Did we have any conversation off, uh, just with the town board chair? Did he give you any inkling of I where they were? I did not have any conversation, conversation specific to this application. All right, thank you. Add? Yes, of, of course. So, uh, so I have personally attended uh, two meetings at the township at this point. Um, introduced, introduced us and our concept at the April uh, town board meeting and then we also did a concept review at the um, uh, forgive me I'm, the, the different governing boards are uh, um, for the township it is the planning planning commission yep um, so overall they were receptive and understanding and agreeable to our our plans um, but just with their schedule they'll be actually hearing and hopefully approving on the on the 21st so they're aware of it um, also, another thing to mention: all of our neighbors, um, within reason, are are aware. We've we've gone around to all the neighboring properties, um, and we've had nothing, no concerns, um, overall support. I think people are 
assured in the sense that we're not pushing for a big wedding venue. You know, that's that's I think a, a lot of people are are pleased with that. We're we're actually kind of pushing more for the small scale individual retreats and gatherings and such. So um, the town is is aware and us as the property owners, we would be completely understanding and receptive if we did need to table it until August. Um, the July 4th date, um, as as was mentioned, um, gives us and you as a board a um, little bit more time for us to uh, get that approved. So, um, And then one other thing to mention as well that uh, Mr. Van Sumren brought up, I believe as I'm thinking about it, what may have happened in that scenario was a different outbuilding. So there's a different building that's next, like real close to the road, which is a, a, it's considered a non-conforming structure at this point. And that I believe the last owners, uh, the Williams in conjunction or along with Mr. Erickson, from what I understand, were trying to utilize that or did utilize it for a while as a, um, some sort of a, um, in or a um, farm keeper's cottage or that kind of thing but since it was within the setback of the road i don't believe the river was ever an issue but since it was within the setback of the road they were unable to push forward with that but is with this particular structure that we're honing in on from what we from from the research that we've done and the work that john has done for us we haven't run into any any roadblocks whatsoever so all right and i'll I'll Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. All right. So, are you making a motion to table? I'd make a motion to table to get the approval, um, or the uh, yeah, the approval of the town of Kinnickinnick Town Board uh, prior to so making our decision. It would be a motion to table until the postponed July. Motion to postpone to a date certain and then indicate the date. Motion to postpone to a date certain, which would be the July meeting. Thank you. Okay, so we have motion and second. All in favor to postpone until the July meeting, say aye. 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 So we are postponed until the July meeting, at which time we have a motion on the table. Thank you. So now we are going to move to uh, public hearing number two. Waiver to reduce the platted structure setback on the lot from 100 to 50 feet along County Highway V pursuant to Section 13.10B1 of St. Croix County Land Division Ordinance. Ellen. Thank you, Chairman Hanson, and uh, good evening. So I will be doing the waivers tonight. Uh, Mike Wozniak, our um, land use administrator, is on vacation. Uh, just trying to get to the first one here. It's going to take a little while. All right, so we have two setback waivers tonight. Both are in the town of Somerset. The first one is Joseph Bell. This is located on 153rd Street and County Road B. This one will be a little bit different from the normal ones as we do have an additional condition we are proposing based on comments from our County Highway Department. So the history of setback waivers is that prior to 2006, our county ordinance and our county um, committees would put a 100-foot structure set back from road right-of-way on all of the plats. Plats cannot, are a um, legal document that cannot be revised without certain pro pro proper procedures. And so um, they were put on both CSMs and major subdivision plats. Um, as of January 1, 2006, that setback was reduced from 100 foot to 50 foot from right-of-way. And so since then, whenever there is a conflict related to that setback, it can be reduced down to the setback in the county zoning ordinance with a proper procedure, which at this time is a vote by this committee, and it does not go on to an additional board. It happens tonight. And then also there must be a correction instrument created by a registered land surveyor filed at the Register of Deeds office, which actually changes that plat officially in the record. So the first one here, as I said, oops, is to reduce the setback on County Road V from 100 foot down to the setback standard of 50 feet. 
This is the picture of the site. I'm just not able to get this to land perfectly here. I'll have to watch it better. Oh, use that one? Okay, thank you. The um, existing shed is shown in red. That will be removed. Over here are some of the other structures. The home, here's County Road B, here's 153rd Street. The property now takes access from 153rd Street when additional subdivision was developed in this area. And the setback, or the um, access off County Road B was no longer used. This goes back a few years. A new structure is proposed, which is outlined in yellow, and which the applicants would like to build when they reduce, remove the other one. However, that would be in the 100-foot setback, which is not permitted. Therefore, we have the setback reduction request. Oops, I got to remember to do that. So these, this is, again, the site plan details, the new shed, the old shed. The visual appeal of the property should be improved. The new location is nowhere near the septic or the drain field, and it would be screened by the road from some, some of the vegetation that's already there. Um, so there is an existing access, actually, still off from County Road B, although it's not used a lot, is our understanding. It's used um, prime, um, very minimally. Um, again, this goes back to 2017, it was changed. Um, uh, in our previous and current zoning ordinances, 2000, chapter 17 and chapter 15, which was adopted in 2019, only one driveway is permitted per residential lot. Um, and it help, when there are more than one driveway or more than, it's a corner lot, as in this particular situation, it has to be from the lower functionally classified road, which means the town road, not a county road. Um, if it was a county and a state, it would be the county road. Um, it also does require a 500-foot separation from the intersection if it was to remain on County Road B, and it did not meet either of those standards. That former driveway did not. So, the Somerset Town Board has recommended approval of the waiver. The County Highway Department is, has also recommended approval, but with conditions that the owner properly abandon and remove the access within the right-of-way and restore the drainage ditch and the vegetation. Uh, the standards by which this committee may approve reductions to the road setback on a plat or survey map are that the setback is in a recorded subdivision and may only be changed by a correction instrument prepared by a Wisconsin registered land surveyor and then thereafter recorded at the Register of Deeds, and that the setback reduction shall only be allowed in the unusual circumstance where a reduction of the setback will allow the lot or structures on the lot to be in greater compliance with the objectives and standards of this ordinance and chapter 15, St. Croix County Zoning Ordinance, and will not negatively impact the layout, design, continuity, or aesthetics of the neighborhood. In most cases, there is no impact to those aesthetics and those other standards and concerns. Um, in this case, because it's a corner lot, it actually will be improved. Um, and when it says this ordinance, it means the Land Division Ordinance Chapter 13. Staff offer the following findings for the committee's consideration. Um, it will allow the um, lot or structures on the lot to be in greater compliance, compliance with the objectives and standards in Chapter 15. Um, due to the existing house and the accessory structures, uh, locations and the high water levels, the vegetation and the drain field location, a reduction to the set structure setback will not have a negative impact. The reduced structure setback will allow the applicant to replace an existing, which apparently is a dilapidated shed, with a new shed that will be more attractive. The town has recommended approval. The county highway department has recommended approval with conditions. So staff do recommend that this be approved to reduce the setback from 100 feet to 50 feet on County Road B right of way based on findings one through five, which I just went through, and with the following conditions. A registered land surveyor must record it at a re uh, correction instrument to reduce the setback per section 13.10 B1 of the land division ordinance, and the existing access road on County B must be abandoned by removing the access reference from the plat using the setback reduction correction instrument so they can do the two things, not just reduce it to 50, but reduce it, remove it completely. So it should be removed completely. Removing the culvert and the driveway material, which are still there from when it was a driveway, reestablishing the drainage ditch and any vegetation to match the existing ditch on either side of the culvert and within the right-of-way, as far back as the right-of-way would go, to the satisfaction of the highway department. Are there any questions? Okay. 
that's it? Yes, that's it. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. That's a great You're presentation. Uh, is there anybody here who would like to speak in favor of this waiver? Favor of the waiver. All righty, let's hear it. Please state your name, where you live. Uh, I'm Joe Bell. This is my property, uh, 323 153rd Avenue. Um, I am in favor of this. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, I did, I did meet, I go to the town board meeting, um, I think it was last week or the week before, and uh, we had good discussion. Um, it seemed fairly straightforward, so that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Enjoy your shed. Is there anybody here who would like to speak against this? Very good. This closes the public hearing. Uh, we will uh, now move into our business item number two uh, and discuss the waiver about the setback. Is there anybody who would like to make a motion? I make a motion that we uh, approve, the waiver. approve it. Yep. Do we have a second? second? We have a second. Any discussion? Let's put it to a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. We have a waiver. Thank you. Now... Uh, public hearing number three, and this is a waiver to reduce platted structure setback on the lot from 100 to 50 feet along 235th Avenue pursuant to section 13.1B1 of St. Croix County Land Division Ordinance, and Ellen gives a presentation. Thank you, sir. So our applicants tonight are Corey Berwald and Melissa Palm. Hopefully I pronounced those correctly. Um, they've request, again requested a setback reduction to the structure setback on property along 235th Avenue from 100 feet to the current zoning standard of 50 feet, and it was published through a class through notice. Uh, this is in, again in the town of Somerset, and we have comments. I won't repeat the history of the structure setbacks. You've already heard that tonight. Um, and I won't repeat the standard, the basic standard, which is the... Um, removal of the existing structure setback on the recorded um, document reg created by a registered land surveyor and the correction instrument then filed with the Register of Deeds Office. Said it differently. So on this site, which it, um, the issue is that Lot 28 has a, great, a very large drainage easement on it. You can see it here outlined. And it also has quite a few structures. Um, there is um, a drain field for their septic system, a shed, um, not quite sure what the, the house, excuse me, a well, and here is the proposed location of a barn they would like to create. This very lightly dotted line along here that goes all the way from here all the way over and then up is the 100-foot setback on the lot, and it would go down to about a 50-foot setback, which would be about this amount right here. The driveway is over in this location if you can see that. Um, has some of the same standard issues. Um, basically, as I said, there's a very large drainage easement that encom encompasses a great deal of the lot. Building options are limited, especially if I was to go back up and note that if they were to build in or go down in this area, for instance, it might be too, at any driveway would probably be too close to the um, intersecting roadway to meet our standards. So also the road lot, the road curves quite a bit at this lot, as you can see, and, but the, however, site uh, lines have been checked, and there will not create any problems. So going down to the next slide, you can see it quite a bit better. Again, the drainage easement area is encompassed by this um, magenta lines, and the requested shed is shown in this black line here. It would be accessed off this driveway, I assume on this driveway proposal expansion to their entrance driveway. Um, the shed will be 60 by 40, and there would not be an impact at all to the roadway, and everything else that would be impacted by this is actually behind the house. St. Drain field, the septic tanks, etc. So, Somerset Town Board has recommended approval and the standards are the same, only allowed in the unusual circumstance where their reduction would allow it to be in greater compliance with the object objectives and standards of the ordinance and will not negatively impact 
the layout design continuity or aesthetics of the neighborhood. We offer the following findings, one through four, um, that it will allow the structure on the lot to be in greater compliance um, due to the existing layout and drainage, vegetation, et cetera. It will not negatively impact layout design or continuity of the neighborhood. The reduced structure setback will allow the proposed structure to be located on an appropriate portion of the lot from an access standpoint, and the Town of Somerset has provided um, comments in approval. Staff recommend approval of the reduction from 100 feet to 50 feet from 235th Avenue with only one condition that, as required by the ordinance, a Wisconsin registered land surveyor record with the Register of Deeds a correction instrument to reduce the setback. Any questions? Thank no. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, continuing public uh, hearing, is there anybody here who would like to speak in favor of the waiver? Is there anybody here who would like to speak opposed to the waiver? And we will end the public hearing and move into the uh, business item, which is business item number three, to uh, approve if we have a motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second. Uh, you need to say the motion? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, you had, I got you down for the motion. Okay. Did you say it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> So I'd make a, a motion uh, to approve the setback reduction from 100 to 50 feet from the 235th Avenue right away based on the staff findings with the following condition that a Wisconsin registered land surveyor must record with the Register of Deeds office a correction instrument to reduce the setback as per section 13.10B1 of the Land Division Ordinance. Well said. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Passes unanimously. Excellent. We are moving on to business item number four, resolution granting easement to adjoining property owners of the Wildwood Trail. So we've all looked at this carefully. Uh, who's going to lead us in conversation here? Ken. Yeah, I can start us out. I'd, I'd like to invite Mr. Yeah. Peavy to come up and join us in the conversation. He's represented the landowners. He's a, an alumni of the county board. How many years did you spend on the county board, Bill? How, how long were you on the county board? 18 years. Bill spent 18 years on the county board. It's a, it's a long time. Howdy, what Bill. Are you? <laughs> so, uh, all right, Ken, let's have it. Yeah, I'll start with the, uh, the background. Um, so... A couple years ago now, I think it was, uh, some of the residents along the trail had gotten uh, an enforcement letter, which really brought into question some um, past practices that adjacent landowners had been doing uh, for years and years. Um, and so that led into the discussions. Uh, I met with Bill and, and some of the other property owners uh, along the trail, and, and they've had you know, some uh, group meetings and discussed it. And so where we got to, I think, was uh, the proposed easement tonight that'll really memorialize um, some of those past practices that had been going on for years and years uh, that the adjoining property owners uh, had enjoyed uh, um, across and along the trail. Um, and so that's, that's what we're proposing tonight is to just sort of clear up uh, that issue uh, and memorialize some of those past practices. So I know Bill has uh, some questions, some clarifying questions that he'd like to have, and, and I think we could have a good discussion and talk through some of those ideas uh, and adjust the language if needed, uh, or maybe it'll be fine uh, just the way it is with some explanation. All right. The way I'd like to do this is uh, I don't like to have business without a motion on the floor, so let's have a motion, and then we can go ahead into conversation. If we need to have an amendment, we will. So uh, I know that we've read it. Or let's have a if we could have a motion to, to approve, and then we can then we can move on with conversation. I make a motion we approve the uh, the easement and the resolution. The res resolution found on page 104. Very good. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Scott counter seconds. Good. I'd like to move into conversation. And Mr. Peavy, what do you what do you have? 
should be used to these things. Uh, thank you for letting me participate in this meeting. I wasn't uh, prepared to come up to the table here, but uh, I, uh, you know, I guess one of your board members uh, told me to be positive, and and I took uh, his word for it. So I'm going to stay positive. Um, I believe this is a very good proposal. Uh, I think it will satisfy 95% of the, the property owners along the trail. Uh, I have a couple questions more than anything, and maybe uh, I think uh, Corp Council will answer more of these than I will. Uh, we had one question that just came up tonight. The width part of it, that would be adjusted for each property owner. Uh, some of us have measured ours, and they're 88 feet. Uh, we measured fence line to fence line. Am I correct on that? that this <clears throat> easement would be parcel to parcel to parcel, and you'd have to adjust. It currently indicates a 99-foot easement, wide easement, and so we could modify that language. It's number three under the trail easement rights um, to in, in, indicate um, not more than 99-foot wide easement. So then it would be whatever though each parcel's. Um, width of the trail would be I, and i don't even know if it's necessary to have the 99 foot wide easement in there, in there so. <laughs> right it is in number three uh in the easement agreement or in, in the easement itself and so we can modify that if that's needed um going forward yeah the resolution says it's between 66 and 99 feet mm -hmm. and the legal description when we finish writing that would be yeah. okay the width would vary based upon that, so width I just, at that yep, location. I just, one of the members want a clarification on that and you know, um, one other, or a couple other uh, items that have come up. Um, I, I would be interested in if we could, and I would probably this would probably be park rules rather than this easement, and I don't want to get off base too far. But uh, those that have residences near the trail, we would be interested in uh, uh, some kind of. A, I'm suggesting 25 mile speed limit for vehicles, which basically is snowmobiles, uh, within. <coughs> And again, I wish the Manson's the Snowbill Association are still here. I said 1,000 feet of residence, but that's negotiable. Mm -hmm. That could be part of park rules, I assume, rather than change the easement. It, it wouldn't fit in the easement, but it would be part. It would be a good part of this discussion. Yeah, I was uh, chatting with Supervisor Ramberg before, um, suggesting that some of these may not fit within the easement, but maybe a future agenda item that we would have to address in a different format. Um, maybe through Chapter 90, uh, which governs uh, park rules. Uh, you could have a park rule similar to that, uh, specific to Wildwood Trail. Yep. Uh, my next item on my short little list, a um, lot of concern about future use of the trail. And, and property, adjacent property owners, we're, we're talking, in today's world, ATVs, UTVs. Uh, they're noisy, you know, we just don't want them on the trail. I don't know how you would address that. So I'm talking about future use of the trail. Um, my suggestion, maybe we could, again, maybe this is a park rule where uh, my suggestion with uh, any future change use of the trail, so I'm talking about additional use from what is used today. Uh, maybe we could have some uh, input with the town board of Town of O'Galley. It represents most of them, rather than try to get reached out to people uh, you know, again, if we want to change the ATV, and who knows what's going to happen in 50 years? Are we going to have jet bikes? I don't know. Are we going to be, you know, jets on? But just any changes from what we use today, uh, maybe that you could have some, uh, I, I don't know how to word it. I'm not a lawyer, thank goodness. And uh, So that would be one suggestion. And I can tell you that in Chapter 30 right now, it indicates that there should be no ATV or UTV use on any parks, including the Wildwood Trail. And so this easement is specific to the adjoining property owners right. using it. But right now, Chapter 30 indicates that the public shall not use the trail, any trails or any parks, um, UTVs or ATVs. So his question, though, is if we change it in the future to allow ATVs on the trail, would we be willing to work cooperatively with the town board in making that ordinance change? And you know, I, my idea was the town board, rather than trying to get together with a bunch of property owners, the three-member board, you know, could. And I'm not even say they would overrule, but again, have input at least, and in, you know, in cooperation or conjunction or whatever. And 
My last concern, and this just, well, Ken was aware of my email about a month and a half ago. Uh, we had somebody going up and down the trail with a pickup and a trailer picking up firewood. Boy, did that irritate a lot of people. <laughs> that, my phone rang a lot that day. Uh, I did reach out to Ken and he told me somebody was authorized to do that. Uh, so I would somehow in the easement, um, my suggestion was, um, Got to write a first refusal to the firewood. I don't know how much there is and until they're joining property owners or or just ban it all together and just have Pat uh, park staff do it. But I don't think it's right to have private parties authorized by the county picking up firewood timber on the trail on you know, which most of us consider private property anyway, so um, I don't know how you would again address that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into that one. Okay. Um, in, in all of our parks, uh, you can get a firewood permit, okay. uh, a, a, lump, a timber permit. And it's, it's very, uh, very specific and, and case by case, depending on if there's down wood, uh, the parks director will have, the parks administrator will have the ability to issue that permit and charge for the wood. Uh, in some places, it's quite remote, and it's a service to the park to go out and get it. Um, and perhaps in the Wildwood Trail, it, it needs to be more restrictive. But I can tell you that there was a fella out in the, Star, the Apple River uh, Star Prairie property, way the heck out there, dragging it out with a lawnmower because we don't allow ATVs. Uh, it, and, and it was a great service because it was crossing the trail. Um, so... Uh, it's it's useful. It, it it is very useful. Yeah. So. It was it was very dangerous for the people to see. You know, I said it was a pickup with a trailer behind. Mm -hmm. I assumed it was parked vehicle. I even asked, uh, asked Ken. But I said the parked vehicle should be marked parked vehicle. Oh, there's my stuff. The parked vehicle should be marked, and then he said it was private. He informed me it was a private person. So, if we could just not have that happening, and I again maybe that's a park rule. Uh, rather than change the easement. I'm not, I'm not sure of that. Uh, we had a bunch of other questions that were answered with an email that I know Tim Ramberg and I think Jerry and Ken got with Tracy, and I think everybody was satisfied with the answers. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know. No, so I, uh, you know, I think I, w I would encourage the board to, uh, committee to approve this and recommend it on up to the county board. Uh, and maybe that wording I've tried to come up with, which I can't, is you know could be part of your motion at the county board level, or here. But uh, yeah, you, you're talking about the ATV UTVs bill. Yeah, all three of them. Yeah, the speed limit, the yeah. ATV, and even the firewood issue is. They'd, they'd yeah. all be, have to be part of the parks rules, not yeah, necessarily the easements. But right. And I appreciate your input, and, and yeah. we'll always take that into account. But. Yeah, men and women may. I see the agenda item where we're going to have that on a agenda to change park rules. Uh, well, yep. Always keep you apprised. I know where the courthouse is, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lot bigger. You might not find it next time. Yeah. Yeah, it'll look a lot different. Yeah. Let me let me ask a follow-up question on the firewood so I can understand where the issue is. So is the issue that uh, the adjacent property owners wanted a chance for the firewood, or they didn't want a truck driving on the trail? Uh, they didn't want the private pro person's truck driving on a trail picking up firewood. Okay. I don't think the amount of firewood up there is worth, I wouldn't bother going, <laughs> taking my time and going out and getting it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it was the private person doing it. Okay. Yeah. If it would have been a park truck, I don't think I would have phone or rang, but yeah. Okay. Is that helpful? No, not particularly, but. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> St. Croix County doesn't want anybody dropping live trees. It's, yeah, I'm it, just talking about downwood. I'm not talking about going out there and cutting any trees down. Okay. This is just, they were picking up stuff that had fallen, or I assume uh, trees that had fallen across the trail previously that parks employees had cut into blocks, right. rolled off to the side. They were picking those up also. Okay, and that yeah. would only ever be done with, with permission or with a permit. So we'll talk about that being done on the trail and... Uh, Oh, sure. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, keep your yes. your words in in uh, into account and get back to you. 
So I, uh, again, I, I encourage you, the committee, to approve or doubt or <coughs> recommend. I suppose you're recommending whatever you guys got to do at this level, uh, this easement. And like I said, it's not going to satisfy 100% of the people because there's no way to do that. Do you have any thoughts or questions for Mr. Peavy or with each other? Administrator. Hey, Mr. Chair, I don't know if anyone else from the public wanted to speak on this issue, but. Oh, sure, if we're opening her up to the public, uh, anybody else have a question or thought on this matter? Sir, if you go to the podium and state your name, that'd be great. Thanks. Tracy Helgeson, and obviously I own land along the Wildwood Trail. Um, I don't know what the legalities are, but I know in the easement document it spoke about the, the rights given to us today could possibly be revoked in the future. Something to that effect by a, by a board of supervisors, or a yeah, county board of supervisors review. So I interpret that to mean that we could be right back here two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, having this same discussion. And like I said, I, I don't know what the legalities are, that it has to be in there or doesn't have to be in there. Sir, uh, even if that wasn't in there, the law is pretty clear that this county board cannot uh, tell an, a future county board how it's going to be. So one, uh, one elected body can't hold, what's the word that I'm looking for? Can't bind. Can't bind the, uh, a future lawmaking board, a county board or a legislature. Uh, so it's put in there just so you know that uh, if the next group isn't as reasonable as we are, yeah, that could happen. And, and uh, let's hope it doesn't. But it's always a possibility because that's the nature of a, of a representative government. Um, you know that. That's why you're running the meeting and not me. <laughs> I believe in transparent government, and that's why it's in the document, sir. And would anybody else care to make a statement or ask a question or bring something forward for the benefit of the order? Sir. What's your, what's your name? Colby. I live on the Wildwood Trail. Okay. O'Galley. And I know Bill. I want to thank him for bringing it up because I looked at the 99-foot wide easement. And when I went out there and measured, it's more like 80, 83 between the old fence line and the new, and both old fence lines and posts. So I didn't know where your 99-foot wide came from. But up here it says something different than what we were sent. So. The resolution says something different than the actual easement. So the resolution says 66 feet to 99 feet, and the actual easement says 99 feet. So we can uh, change number three to indicate 66 feet to 99 feet, if that will help clarify it for the adjoining property owners. So what the lawyer is saying <laughs> is that when you go down the trail, it changes every couple of feet because the fence line's not all parallel. Mm -hmm. So we're changing it to rec reflect the fact that it's not all perfectly parallel and yours might be a little bit different than the guy down the trails. It's, okay. Yeah, thanks Thank for- Thank you for the clarification. Yep, thanks, Thank for, you, thanks for bringing it up. Would anybody else like to have a, a stab at it? Okay. You guys have a question or comment? Why don't we vote on this thing and put it to bed? Supervisor um, Hansen, does somebody want to make a motion to amend number three of the, well, I suppose, as long as you give me the authority to amend the easement based on the conversation, there's no change necessarily to the resolution, just to the easement agreement if that discussion is just, doesn't necessarily have to be a motion per se, but that I can correct number three to indicate the 66 feet to 99 feet, which would be consistent with the resolution. All right, let's have a, let's make this, let's make this according to Hoyle. Let's have a, let's have an amendment. Amendment. 
I'll make the amendment to um, to match. Where did that go? The uh, the resolution from a distance of 66. Was it 66 to 99? 66 to 99 feet wide easement. A second. We have a second. We're voting now on the amendment. All in favor, say aye. 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 No opposed. It's a it's a unanimous. Now we will vote on the amended resolution. Uh, Found packet page 104. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 We're not opposed. That passes unanimously. Mr. Peavy, Mr. Peavy's neighbors, thank you. Look forward to uh, being good neighbors and look forward to uh, an era of good communication. So call any time. Thank, thank you, you, committee, and thank you, uh, uh, Administrator Witt. Thank you, uh, Corp. Council Amos. Uh, it's been a challenging work through, but I, again, like you say, we got something that'll work for 95% of the people along the trail, and the other 5% we're going to have to, everybody's going to have to deal with. Yep. Thank you again. The town board has to deal with those other 5%, by the way. <laughs> All right. Right now we're looking at a report regarding the permitted and conditional uses in the Ag 2 zoning district, and that'll be John. So Mr. Chair and committee members, this item is on the agenda. This was a follow-up from our May Community Development Committee meeting, and it was actually part of a hearing regarding a rezoning in the town of Kinnick. Kinnick, um, the action that was before you in May was for a rezoning to an Ag 2 district. And there were two directions that the uh, committee provided staff. One, that we were going to table the request of the rezoning for the town of Kinnick to reconsider their recommendation. And then the second item was for staff just to put together some very basic information about the agricultural zoning districts within the county. So we just put together a very brief PowerPoint presentation to kind of give you the background of how the Ag 2 district came to be and what it means. So right now in St. Croix County, we have two agricultural zoning districts, Ag 1 and Ag 2. Both of these districts meet the criteria for certification as farmland preservation zoning districts under state statutes, and we'll get to that in just a minute on the importance of that. But in order to have the Ag 1 and Ag 2 districts, the county has to adopt a farmland preservation plan and a farmland preservation plan map. So these items were um, created and adopted in 2012 and were approved by the Department of Agriculture Trade and Consumer Protection, or DATCAP. DATCAP must certify all farmland preservation zoning ordinances within the county. Now, the main emphasis for the ag zoning districts is that they essentially regulate growth within the county, they preserve properties used for ag purposes, and they provide tax credits to property owners in participating towns. So that's why we have the involvement of DATCAP there are credits and monies involved, and so DATCAP is the overseeing agency at the state level that certifies these agricultural zoning districts. This map um, above just briefly shows you um, the zoning districts within the county. We have 17 of 21 townships under county zoning. You see the X's marked out for the to towns that have their own zoning, those being forest, St. Joe, Hudson, and Troy. And right now within the county, the Ag 1 zoning districts are marked by green. And 20% of county zoning is occupied by the Ag 1 zoning district. And then the secondary Ag zoning district, Ag 2, that's shown in blue, primarily in Pleasant Valley and Erin Prairie, make up about 5% of all county zoning districts. So in order to have an ag zoning district, um, the county needed to establish criteria in 2012. And so in conjunction with DATCAP and the Soil Conservation Service, there were some objective criteria that had to be met for a, a property to qualify for ag one and ag two zoning. 
So the map you see on the screen is what we call the Farmland Preservation Plan map. And these uh, properties were scored based on objective criteria that we kind of highlighted in the left margin. And so depending on the soil texture, the erodibility, wetness capacity, flooding potential, slopes, permeability, you know, those are more the land evaluation type of criteria. And then we get into a site assessment criteria, which is the second bullet point. And properties are scored based on contiguous ownership, compatibility of adjacent land uses. So if it's farming in one major area, you score higher. Existing land use policy of adjacent sites, distance to public sewer in some of the villages and cities, and then site and town planning policy. So if you look at the map, you see some white areas for properties that don't qualify primarily around cities and villages. It's just that they're too close to these entities and that these entities do show future growth into these areas. So that's really a land use policy issue. And when property is identified for future development, obviously the properties don't score as high for egg use. Not all properties eligible for farmland preservation are zoned ag. So example, you know, going back to the zoning map, you'll see some of our very eastern towns such as Glenwood, Emerald, Springfield. They're zoned R1, even though they're in the farmland preservation plan. It's just that those towns have chosen not to take a more active role in participating in the tax credit program. These parcels are still eligible for ag zoning that these towns are not active participants for the tax credit program. As part of the state certification process, um, counties must allow, by statute, we have to allow the following uses. Um, obviously, ag uses, and this is where we get into some of the ag entertainment questions. So accessory uses are required as a permitted or conditional use the county has to allow those. And these include an activity or business that is an integral part of an agricultural use or a business, whether or not associated with an ag use, that is conducted by the owner of the farm and employees no more than four full-time employees. So in some of our ag areas, we have ag entertainment, but we also have home occupations. We have uses such as um, um, mechanics, on farm implementation type of vehicles. And so we do have accessory uses that we need to allow by statute. And then other uses that we need to allow are ag-related uses, non-farm residences and cluster subdivisions, government and religious uses, open space, and utilities. And again, statute is very specific. We cannot exclude any of these uses in the ag-1 and ag-2 districts. Real quickly, our zoning standards for the Ag 2 district, um, to establish how many households you can develop, you're allowed two principal dwellings per 40 acres or one per 20. Those eligibilities have to be at least on a parcel three acres in size. And major subdivisions are not allowed in the Ag districts. And major subdivisions are defined as <clears throat> property resulting in five or more lots. AG-1 is a little bit more restrictive. AG-1, I didn't put on here, but AG-1 allows only one principal dwelling per 40 acres. So you can see the trade-off. The AG districts preserve prime farmland. They are eligible for tax credits, um, but they do limit the amount of residential development that can happen in those areas. I have enclosed just a brief list from our permitted use table. Um, you'll see AG-1, AG-2 at the top left. You can go all the way down and AG-1 and AG-2 are, are similar in terms of the AG uses allowed. Um, every AG use in our land use category is allowed either as a permitted or conditional use. And then as we get into the R1 and R2 districts, you see some of those AG uses begin to taper off, such as the size of livestock facilities, um, manure processing facilities, and then as we get to the egg entertainment, which I think was the genesis for this discussion, egg entertainment um, is allowed as an accessory use um, if it's under 15 days per year. And then if it's more than 15 days per year, 
it's a conditional use permit which is required. And we kind of talked about that last month a little bit. So again, some of the regulations we have in place that govern and regulate ag entertainment. So again, in ag one, ag two, ag entertainment is allowed as a permitted use if activities do not exceed 15 calendar days per year. If they do exceed that amount, they are required to get a conditional use permit from the Board of Adjustment, which requires a public hearing and notification of adjacent owners. Additionally, whether you're a permitted use or a conditional use, if any event exceeds 100 persons during a 24-hour period, an event plan is required, which is an administrative permit issued by staff. And that plan has to address parking, days and hours of the event, ingress and egress for traffic, sanitation, signs, um, solid waste management. And again, this is reviewed with a land use permit. And then that event plan must be filed with the town clerk, fire department, emergency medical and respective law enforcement agencies. And this is somewhat important for the committee to understand. So these standards were put in place and adopted in 2012. So they're about 11 years old. These provisions did not change uh, in 2019 for some of the newer committee members. The, the, the county um, began a comprehensive zoning revision. It began in 2017. We spent two years working on it with all of our towns, our residents, property owners, interested groups. And through that process, it was agreed that we would not visit the ag standards. So even though we spent a lot of time revising our ordinance, we did not change any of the standards that are on uh, the screen that you see there. And then real quickly, maybe for the benefit of those in attendance, what is a conditional use permit? Uh, a conditional use permit is a zoning tool. It regulates and governs the use of land with the zoning map and an ordinance text. So the text describes the purpose of the district and then establishes standards for buildings and specific uses. Um, within each district, on that use table I showed you before, a use is either identified as permitted and conditional. A permitted use is presumed compatible with a zoning district's purpose and allowed by right with an administrative land use permit. When we get into conditional use permits, it's generally presumed that it's compatible but may have potential impacts and need additional review, which is why it then goes to the County Board of Adjustment for review and consideration of appropriate conditions. And then we attach some additional information in your packet, the State Farmland Preservation brochure um, for your information. So again, that summarizes what we put together. Again, I think this is more of a follow-up from our May meeting that we had. So if there are any questions, uh, we can certainly try and answer those. Every time I hear something like this, I learn something. Uh, I appreciate the presentation. You guys have any questions? Sure, Jerry. So in 2019, why did they not change the ag standards? Everybody was happy with that, or what's the... Uh, I mean, they, they didn't even dress them the way it seems. So was it a time constraint? Was it a... Yeah, so we had some initial scoping meetings. So when we began the project, we had... Um, a land use committee put together. We met with staff, different agencies, and um, based on the feedback we got and with the standards being adopted in 2012, it was just five years prior. So again, we started the, the bigger revision in 2017. So at that point, the standards were, I don't want to say relatively new, but only five years old. So we did not revisit those for that reason. All right. Well, that's anything. Anything else? Okay. I just. Helen. John, have we had any other complaints since 2017? That I, I'm not aware of a lot. I mean, we have complaints about little things here and there, but nothing substantial. Where because we identify, and if you all recall, we did do an update um, when we found things that were people weren't happy with with the 2019. We did that um, last year, I think. 
So I don't believe there was any agricultural district items that we brought up because there haven't been any real serious issues that, to my knowledge. We did not. Very good. I appreciate it. I really deeply appreciate the presentation. Um, next up, we have a resolution approving application for county conservation aids grants, and that will be Ellen. Thank you. So St. Croix County has been partners with the St. Croix County Sportsman's Alliance. I shouldn't say St. Croix County, but the St. Croix Sportsman's Alliance. And that organization every year um, works towards finding ways. They work with a wide variety of other organizations in the county, um, Trout Unlimited, um, Rod and Gun Clubs, um, specific um, uh, the Pheasants Forever, etc. A lot of various organizations. And they work to find ways to improve and uh, access and opportunities for fish, fishing, hunting, etc. And every year it's a very small amount of money. It's about $2,000 that we get in a state grant and $2,000 that the county matches. It's actually 1988 but we always put 2000 in the budget because that's Ken likes round numbers. I used to try to put 1988 and he kept changing it on me, so I gave in. Um, so uh, anyway, we have been doing this for longer than I've been with the county, well over 35 years. This partnership has been going on forever, as long as we can. And we don't always do a project every year. Sometimes they wait and actually combine it into a slightly larger project. Instead of $4,000, 8000 and do one project over two years. Uh, that's about the extent of how much it's been varied or changed, but we do have to have an authorizing resolution, and this resolu we try to work with the DNR to get them to let us not have to do these every single year, and so this one would be good for five years. So that's what this is about. And um, there is in the background, rather than just this part, a little bit of a narrative, if I can get to it, try and do it this that um, lists a wide variety of projects, and I can assure you that just in the past 10 years, every one of these projects on this list has been done. And that's just in the past 10 years. So that's where I came up with the list for my head. <laughs> so any questions on why we should approve this grant or this uh, resolution to continue doing this project? Any questions? Okay. Um. I emceed the uh, the last banquet that they had, and when I was doing, I did just fundraising for this group. I wrote a uh, a history. I interviewed some of their old timers and did a history. They have been in existence since the 1950s, so there's been a whole long succession of old timers, um, and it's it, often Buck Malik would come and give a presentation at this point, and I I have. Uh, I didn't think of inviting him for this, but uh, there has been very few projects that have been done since the 1950s along the lines of fish cribs or boat launches or fishing piers that have not been touched by this organization, their fundraising and their manpower uh, that have been built in St. Croix County since since the middle of the last century. And, and uh, we owe them, this is like the friends group to uh, uh, youth experiencing uh, wildlife and, and sportsmanship in our in our county. So I'm, I'm proud of the organization. I'm proud to have been associated with them um, and, and our grandfathers and our grandfathers' grandfathers. So anyway, that's my two cents. Uh, can I have a motion? Make a motion. A second. All right. And any further discussion or sentimentality? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. So thank you very much. Um, next is uh, consideration of capital improvements for Parks Division. So is that Ken or is that Chuck? That That's Chuck, Mr. Myers. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? Great. Chairman. Get to the 
parks area here. Okay, we have we have eight projects for your consideration today. Um, first one is is eighteen thousand uh, dollars. The KIP um, is a five year is a five year capital improvement plan. Um, so um, initially focus on twenty twenty four, and then we can review um, the, the other items. Um, first of all, it's for parks equipment, for UTV, UTVs, we can put eighteen thousand dollars in the budget for each year. Um, but then the second one is fifty thousand dollars for ongoing maintenance for um, the parks driveways and parking lots that type of thing um, the third one um, which has been on here since 2017 is the bike pedestrian plan SCRC loop trail to Willow State Park connection um, that also has a grant associated with that at 80 percent and uh, if we didn't get the grant obviously we probably more than likely wouldn't do that project um, the next one is the Glen Hills nine nine camping cabins with infrastructure at one almost 1.7 million dollars um, next one is the squad squad lake boat landing replacement um, and then this is for um, fiscal year 27 um, next one is a uh, 920,000 upgrade in the 1970 1970s Glen Hill um, campus entrance station for flush restaurants and just basic improvement from 1970 and uh, the next one is the Eckerd Bluffland Park development at 16.5 million dollars next n next one final one it's a 24 site RV campground for large RVs with infrastructure um, in order to do the projects that, that are in fiscal year 25 we'd have to issue bonds about 27.5 million dollars and um, there's some funding for um, the like I said the, the um, bike pedestrian plan and also the DNR grant for the Glen Hills camping project in fiscal year 26. Are there any questions? So these will all be discussed at the Committee of the Whole? Yeah, next steps then, Chuck. So after tonight? Uh... Yeah, and after tonight it'll be the, the, the um, Committee of the Whole where we discuss these. Yep. So um, we also provided background materials for those. So I have copies of that here that I'd just like to give you guys to look at between now and that meeting for the Committee of the Whole. Excellent. And those background materials um, provide the brief summary that was provided up there, but also discuss the need, how it meets the um, strategic plan, and has one page of information that might for most of them, not for the necessity or the ongoing maintenance ones, but might so provide some little greater information. Many, most of you know about all of these projects. They've been on the list for um, a little while now. Um, just a clarification, the one about the um, bike ped plan implementation, if you recall, that is a three-phase project and phase one is under construct, is being happening now. And these two that are on here are phases two and three, just to make sure that's it's it is kind of started to a certain extent. Chuck, being newer, wouldn't probably remember that kind of a detail. So sorry about that. Well, more than likely, you know, yeah, a couple months in. <laughs> yep, no problem. If anyone else would like a copy of this, I have a few extra also. And then um, I just wanted to give you a couple of interesting points related to our capital projects for parks. Um, I know that none of them are exactly planned for next year related to the um, importance of our new building project, but um, a few things just uh, for information. We, Julie took a look back for us, and um, since 2012, our in revenues for our parks have gone up 107%. And a great deal of that has to do with the capital improvements, 
not just facilities, but also things like our online reservation system and other things like that that have made a huge difference in how much people are using our park system. Um, I'd also just like to say that just this week there was a big news re press release that came out from Wisconsin State Tourism and talked about um, Wisconsin had a record-breaking year this past year, 23.7 billion total economic impact of tourism in this state. Um, looking a little more locally, it talks about 111 million visits to Wisconsin, 1.5 billion in state and local taxes, 1.3 billion in federal taxes. Um, there's more detail to that, but I'll keep it short. Um, in St. Croix County here, our total economic impact from tourism was 208 million, which was an 11% increase from 21 to 22, just in one year. And direct impact, because that does include um, other related things that support tourism, but direct impact from our tourism in this county was 113 million, and that's direct visitor spending is how it is listed. Uh, excuse me, 127.8 million in 2022. State of Wisconsin. Department. Department of um, Tourism Economics from Department of Tourism. So those are a couple of things. I'd also like to tell you that locally, um, we have seen that our new QR code, uh, not only is it popular, uh, for instance, and it's uh, doing its job, we've had four weeks in a row with uh, every single person who has been at Pine Lake when we've done spot checks has been paid, which is the first time. So, <laughs> and also we haven't seen hardly any, we haven't seen any thefts. Cross our fingers, knock on wood. Our QR codes are also working in another way. We have sold online sales so far this year have actually surpassed just through June 1st all of our online sales last year. So people like the QR codes, the numbers are going really good. well, people are buying and they're doing well. Our um, activity at our parks, do we need more parks? Do people like our parks? Memorial Day, we have 75 parking spaces at Homestead Parklands. We had 400 cars that day, 400. Every time someone left, someone else came in. Had to have staff down at the entrance JR, our parks administrator, was the one doing it, literally letting one in, one out, 400 cars in one day at Homestead. Um, by the same token, the following weekend, we had over 500 cars. That was over two days, Saturday and Sunday. But again, we were, had nonstop traffic and people coming in and out. On Sunday, we had 385 cars. So that's two weekends in a row we had that. Um, if you ask, well, we've got a lot of great parks. Uh, in talking to other people, incidental, I didn't see it myself, but every time Memorial Weekend, the whole weekend that you drive, drove past Willow River State Park, people were, parked, were out on Highway 12 waiting to get in. So it's very, very popular. Our parks are, they've been discovered. The impact of COVID is not going away. So I'd just like to add those um, important reasons why we need to keep thinking about keeping our park facilities um, improved and expanded as just as we've talked numerous times and I've heard the board talk numerous times about um, we have a growing population that we need to serve. We have a growing population that expects recreational opportunities also. It's a big reason about why people move to this county. So, And lastly, I'd just like to show you from our grand opening. If you recognize a certain gentleman in this picture, thank you to Mr. Van Summeren for being at our grand opening. And this is a picture. We had about 20, 25 people there the, for the actual ribbon cutting. And then over, throughout the rest of the course of the day, we probably had another 20, 25. A lot of people came from the other campgrounds uh, on our site and were very, very um, complimentary about the new facility. It looked gorgeous and it still does and it's being rented and we're quite happy with that. So, and it officially opened the day before the grand opening. So it was a tight to getting it all the work done. So just thought I'd share that with everyone. Maybe it made the, everybody not think about it. So I'm gonna send home with all of you too that day at the grand opening. We did hand out to people so they could think about it. A little summary of the new campground. So feel free to take these, share them with other people has a little layout in the back, lists the amenities, 
and the QR code can be used to sign up to go camping immediately. So thank you for that time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ellen. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Chuck. Do you have anything else? No, I don't. Okay. Appreciate your time. That moves us into my favorite part of the day. <laughs> Financial report. I turn around and the crowd's gone every time I get ready to give my financial report. I'm starting to get paranoid. Um, so the financial report in the packet is through the month of May. Uh, what I would say is that uh, everything looks to be um, uh, tracking very similar to what it was in uh, prior years. Um, and the uh, um, expenses are on target uh, where they should be at this point in the year. Uh, if there are any questions that you had specifically on there, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I don't have any big highlights for you. Jerry. I have a question. On the first page, the first the register of deeds, I see that we're 405.81% over budget. And when I see 405% over budget, it kind of scares me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I see that in my own checkbook, but yep. you know, I, can, I can answer for that one. I want you to answer for this one, please. Yeah. So it's being uh, based off of $784 spent versus a $155 budget. So employee other expenses uh, happens to be the default setting uh, whenever credit card purchases are made. So if they don't classify it as what it should be, that's the default of what line it goes into. Um, so that's probably what's happened here. Now what I will tell you though is that the department head is um, evaluated based upon the bottom line of the budget, not on any one particular line. So the fact that there's $600 over on that line does not concern me at all. I look at the overall bigger picture for the department um, in the evaluation of them financially. But at least I know you're looking. Thank you. And if anyone's wondering why there's a red, uh, line item in the parks budget that's in red, that is a line item that we run all of the snowmobile expenses through. And as you know, there was a lot of snow last year, this last winter, so it is over because of the extra grooming, and we do get reimbursed for that. So even though we're over in expenses, eventually we will be over in revenue also. How about the donation in, in parks? We've got a $2,090 donation. Where'd that come from? Uh, I'd be happy to answer that, unless Ken wants to. Nope. Go ahead. Um, we had someone donate to have a bench put along the um, loop trail. Um, most of you won't know, but there was a gentleman named Howard LaVenture, affectionately known as the King of Holton. And he uh, has passed away this past year, and his family is putting a bench and a very nice plaque in. So that's very nice. That's all I've got. Anybody else? Ken, thanks very much. That brings us to announcements and correspondence. Mm -hmm. We're still hoping that some of you will be interested. I believe one person might have already signed up for the workshop on the water. There's plenty of space left. If you haven't, again, we will pay for you to go. <laughs> Can't ask for a better deal, can you? I'm signed up for it. I believe, thank you. I was pretty sure somebody was. And if you can't make it, you can't make it. July 27th, or June 27th, July 25th. So if you need to take this as a reminder, we've got plenty of copies, but. We'd love for you to attend. It's a great opportunity to get on the water on the St. Croix, learn a little more about the water, view the river, and better understand the rules and regulations. That it doesn't get all that technical. Um, they, we try to have only one technical presentation, and the others will be more anecdotal stories and um, just uh, in uh, kind of uh, uh, in enthusiastic speech. How's that? It won't be me, but someone else. All right. Uh, request for future agenda items. Anybody got anything yet? Scott? While we're putting off the Eckert 
bluff land uh, trail or, and uh, the develop park development here for a few years but looking out that far um, I was wondering if uh, we may want to at least discuss uh, potential for a uh, working in collaboration with uh, some of the uh, our military organizations around the area for an innovative readiness training exercise um, similar to what they did at the parklands in the city in Richmond for park development. Um, with those, there's a process to go through to get them to do it, and uh, we do need to um, post that we're considering using this uh, because if there's any objections from businesses that can okay. interfere. Well, but anyway, something for a discussion point yeah. for the future. Yep, we got the gist of that. Any other requests for future agenda items? I was going to ask you if you wanted any of those things that Bill Peavy had brought up as an agenda item in the future, or you can bring them up at a later time also. Um, I think I would like to work through what our parks administrator thinks of that. I want to give him deference before we bring it to the committee. Um, the date of the next meeting uh, is what do we have? We've got a work session coming up, right? Yeah. Monday. Next week, Monday. Monday. Yeah, what time does that happen? 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Monday. Be here Monday at 5 p.m., right? And then, uh, yeah, I have that written down. Uh, so see you Monday. Otherwise, the next regular meeting is July 17th. So with that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thanks for coming.